السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى لا سيما المصطفى صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا Dear viewers everywhere, welcome to a new episode in the series of Tendering the Heart. We started this series by explaining some of these beautiful hadith which Imam al-Bukhari, may Allah have mercy on him, collected in the book of Al-Riqaq or How to Make Your Heart Tender and Soften Your Heart. Today, inshallah, we'll begin a new chapter in the same book which is Combination Between Hope and Fear. I will begin the chapter by a hadith which is Al-Imam Al-Bukhari have collected and it is narrated by Abu Hurairah, may Allah be pleased with him. عن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه قال سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول إن الله خلق الرحمة يوم خلقها مئة رحمة فأمسك عنده تسعا وتسعين رحمة وأرسل في خلقه كلهم رحمة واحدة فلو يعلم الكافر بكل الذي عند الله من الرحمة لم ييأس من الجنة ولو يعلم المؤمن بكل الذي عند الله من العذاب لم يأمن من النار أبو هريرة من الله في بليز ودهم نريتد أن الرفض صلى الله عليه وسلم سيد Verily Allah created mercy The day he created it He made it into 100 parts He withheld with him 99 parts And sent only one part to all his creatures. And had the non-believer known all the mercy which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had withheld with him in his hands, he would not lose hope of entering paradise, even though he is a non-believer. And had the believer known of all the punishment which is present with Allah, he would not consider himself safe from the fire of hell. The hadith addresses several things. The very prominent address in the hadith is the vast mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how merciful is Allah the Almighty? Mercy is one of His beautiful traits. And sometimes when we speak about human beings as merciful, we may think that this person is merciful like he is weak. Now, Allah the Almighty maintains the traits of power, of strength. He is the most powerful. He is the most merciful as well. So this trait of mercy does not diminish his power the least or belittle any of his strength, but he maintains both. The hadith also says that when Allah created mercy, he divided it into 100 parts. He withheld with him 99 parts what for so that on the day of judgment and during reckoning the believers who need some help and who will be eligible for the intercession will get it and Allah will have mercy on them then accordingly they will enter paradise via Allah's mercy alone if you remember a couple episodes back, we spoke about a hadith in which Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that most surely none of you shall enter paradise simply because of his or her good deeds. They said, even you, O Prophet of Allah, they said, even me, unless if Allah covers me with his mercy. And we did explain the meaning of this hadith in details, especially the last segment. So out of this huge mercy and vast mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will make the believers who are full of shortcomings and have sinned a lot, but they are believers. They believe in the oneness of Allah will make them eligible to be saved, to receive salvation and enter paradise. This is indeed the greatest news. There are so many hadith describing that when Allah sent down on earth only one part, out of 100 parts of his mercy 
Out of this one part, we love one another, we have mercy on each other, we pardon each other, and out of this one part, a mother looks after her baby, breastfeeds him, and whenever he's sick, she keeps up all night long, and she's very merciful with her baby. Not only the human beings, because they comprehend what they are doing, but also the animals. Several so hadith explain, out of this one part, even the wild animals left their hooves from their babies. Because imagine a lion or a desert or any of those wild animals. When they have babies, they're wild. But they comprehend that those babies are theirs. So they defend them. Even they, be, they, they, they behave violently and aggressively with other animals. But when it comes to their babies, they're very merciful. So they bring them food, they look after them until they're capable to rely on themselves in earning their provision, and so on. In a specific hadith, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned the horse. It left its hoe from its baby. The horse is a very hyperactive animal. But it comprehends, that's my baby. Why? All the mercy and the merciful treatment all over the earth, in the entire world, is simply because of this one part of Allah's mercy, which He sent down amongst us in this life. So I want you to imagine if this is the case, and out of this one part, Allah the Almighty is having mercy and giving respite to the non-believers, those who accuse Him of having a child, of having a son, of having a wife, of having partners in the Lordship, and in the worship, but well, he gives them respite, and he still provides for them, and he still answers their call whenever they are sick and they say, Oh God, give me shifa, make me recover, make me feel better, even though they are non believers. You know, even those who don't believe in the existence of God, if we're all flying while airborne, if the flight experiences some air pumps, what happens? Everybody, automatically, everybody says, oh my God, oh my God. Who is God? He's the only God. So he saves us while airborne, while sailing in the middle of the oceans and the seas. And while walking on earth, he saves us from dangers. He sustains for us. He maintains our life. And amongst us, or the vast majority of the human beings, believe not in his oneness. All of that, out of this one single part, of 100 parts, of his mercy. So this statement would show you how much mercy Allah the Almighty have saved for the believers on the Day of Judgment. Once before we had a chance to speak about the combination of using the two names of Allah in Al-Basmala. And in the first ayah of Surah Al-Fatiha, Al-Basmala is to recite, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. The word Ar-Rahman is merciful, most merciful. Ar-Rahim, likewise. But of course, if you know Arabic, you will figure out the difference between Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. Yes, both are derived from the root word mercy or rahmah but ar-rahman provides a specific meaning different than ar-rahim ar-rahim is very specific it is specific for the believers so his mercy which will be continuous in this life and in the hereafter will be exclusively for the believers and his mercy, which covers every one of his creatures, believers and non-believers, he utilizes the word Ar-Rahman, and that's why sometimes they give the English meaning as the gracious and the beneficent. Because everybody is beneficiary and benefiting from his mercy, even if they were not believing in him. But as far as his Rahma and his mercy, which is very vast, which will be continuous, through which, insha'Allah, we will receive salvation and enter paradise, Ar-Rahim. 
الرحيم إن سورة الأعراف إن آية نمبر 156 After Prophet Moses peace be upon him repented unto Allah on behalf of his disciples and so on Allah the Almighty said ورحمتي وسعت كل شيء Brothers and sisters rejoice No matter how much your sins are how great, how big. Allah the Almighty says, and indeed my mercy have encompassed everything. Wasi'at, kulla shay, kulla shay, everything, all things, yes. Fasa'aktubuha lilladheena yattaqoon. I shall ordain it for those who fear me and keep their duties to me. ويؤتون الزكاة والذين هم بآياتنا يؤمنون and those who give in a charity they pay their alms and they believe in my verses may Allah make us amongst them the hadith is talking about the quality of keeping balance between hope and fear one who does not comprehend the hadith and does not comprehend this ayah which I just mentioned properly ورحمتي وسعت كل شيء will fall in either one of the following two categories is either a person who believes that his sins are much bigger than any forgiveness and beyond count and accordingly he loses hope and he despairs says not a chance in this regard prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam tells us in a hadith which is narrated by Abu Hurairah, may Allah be pleased with him, that there was a man from the nations before us. Asraf ala nafsih. Asraf, yani he exceeded the limits. He's done all the bad things, all the major sins. And at the time of death, he feared the punishment of his Lord. So he requested from his children to do something to him. He said, whenever I die, make sure that you burn my body then collect the ash and on a windy day throw it in the stream so they did they fulfilled his will and soon as they did that Allah the Almighty gathered all the particles of his body then he revived them again he brought them back to life and said my servant why did you do that he said because I was afraid of your punishment I was afraid of you. So he thought with his limited understanding that, that if they burn his body into ash and then it is thrown on a windy day in the stream, it would be like, you know, difficult for Allah to resurrect him again, bring him back to life. But Allah did eventually. And he said, why did you do that? He said, I was afraid of your punishment. He said, my servant, I have forgiven you all your sins. Why? Sometimes we read a hadith and we don't really, really get the point. The point in this hadith, because this man was a believer. This man believed that there will be a reckoning, there will be a resurrection, there will be hereafter. And he was afraid that his fate may be in fire because of his multiple sins and magnitude, faults, and so on. And because of that, he thought if his body was burned, then he would be saved. So Allah the Almighty showed him his power and ability of reviving the dead. Then furthermore, he said, my servant, I have forgiven you all your sins. The second category is a person who is a loser and who thinks that he is eligible for Allah's mercy because he said Allah forgives all sins without acquiring forgiveness without taking the proper means of being forgiven, being eligible for his mercy, such person is a loser. Why? Because he gave precedence to hope. And he neglected entirely the concept of fear. Salvation would require the person to fly with two wings. One of whom is hope and the other is fear. That was the case of all the companions of the Prophet Even the ten heaven-bound companions 
whom the Prophet ﷺ named them. He said, Abu Bakr fil Jannah, Umar fil Jannah, Uthman fil Jannah, Ali fil Jannah, Abu Ubaid ibn al-Jarrah, Az-Zubayr, etc., etc. He named 10 companions and he said that they will be in heaven. He received the revelation from Allah, they will be in heaven. Not a single one of them sat comfortably and said, that's it. I'll be saved. I don't have to do anything. Rather, they maintain the balance between hope and fear. We'll continue talking about this very important equilibrium after the short break, inshallah. Stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, said that the greatest ayah in the Quran with regards to hope and optimism, delivering the good news, is the ayah of Surah Az Zumar. It's ayah number 53. In this ayah, Allah the Almighty says, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Allah in this ayah is addressing whom? He is not addressing the righteous servants, those who excelled in every field of worship. No, he is addressing the big time sinners. Those who have done every bad thing to the point that they really, really exceeded all boundaries and crossed all the red lines. Say, O Muhammad, peace be upon him, to my servants, Allah is saying, tell my servants who have indeed transgressed against themselves. Because guess what? When you commit a sin, you hurt no one but yourself. So what is the message that Allah wants to deliver to such servants? Despair not of Allah's mercy. لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله Despair not of Allah's mercy. Why? Because Allah forgives all sins. إن الله يغفر الذنوب جميعا For him, he is the oath forgiven, the most merciful. Once the Nabi صلى الله عليه وسلم said there were two best friends from the children of Israel. One of whom was a very dutiful servant, and the other was a sinner. So the righteous one, every time, advised his intimate friend, fear Allah, keep your duty to him, you should worship Allah, you should cease sinning, you should quit doing the bad deeds, and so on. And the other person, every time, would say, just leave me and Allah. Allah will forgive me, I'm trying, etc. As many of us sometimes give, uh, or give those excuses, until one day, the righteous servant and the righteous friend saw his friend was doing something terrible, something really bad. So he remarks saying, by Allah, Allah will never forgive you. He made this remark because he had become judgmental. Right away, Allah sent the angel of death who took the souls of the two friends. Then he brought them unto him, revived them. And he said to the sinner, who was just judged by his righteous friend as he will not be eligible for Allah's mercy and he will never be forgiven. He said, my servant, I have forgiven your sins, enter heaven by my mercy. And he said to the righteous servant who have become judgmental, as far as for you, فَقَدْ أَحْبَطُ عَمَلَكَ I have ruined all your deeds and have not accepted any of them. Take him to fire. Why? He becomes judgmental. Like he's distributing Allah's mercy. And he knows who will be eligible and who will not be eligible. And who should be forgiven and who should not be forgiven. This hadith is very important, brothers and sisters. That we should not be judgmental of others. And subhanAllah, if every one of us was just to worry about himself and herself, we'll be just fine. We'll be able to reform the entire Muslim society. Our problem is being judgmental of others. Then also deciding their fate and who will be forgiven and who will not be forgiven is none of your business. That is up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is a similar hadith in the same line. 
it's a sound hadith which teaches us that uh, forgiveness is very achievable, paradise is very near, but meanwhile you have to work for it, or otherwise the opposite is near as well. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in this hadith, الْجَنَّةُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَىٰ أَحَدِكُمْ مِنْ شَرَاكِ نَعْلِهِ وَالنَّارُ مِثْلُ ذَلِكِ He said, paradise is nearer to any of you than his shoelace. I mean, if I just uh, lean over right now to tie my shoelace, I don't have a shoelace anyway. If I do that, it's not a big deal, right? Well, the Prophet ﷺ said, Paradise is nearer to any of you than your own shoelace. But wait a minute. That is not the end of the statement. He said, And the fire of hell is likewise. is very near. What does it mean? It means, brothers and sisters, heaven is achievable. Forgiveness can be gained simply by making just a little effort. But if you're negligent of all of that, then you ask for it. You will find the fire of hell is very near as well. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that he divided his mess when he created it to 100 parts and he kept with him 99 parts to the point that in the hadith, if the non-believer were to know how much vast mercy Allah has, he would still hope to enter paradise even though he's a disbeliever. In another hadith which is narrated by, collected by Tabarani, even though it's a, it's a weak hadith, but I like just to mention its meaning to comprehend the status of an unbeliever hoping to enter paradise because of knowing how merciful is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And eventually that will not happen as the Quran stated. But the hadith says that on the day of judgment because of the vast mercy of Allah which Allah will show towards the believers and intercession and pardoning people and having mercy on them and taking them to heaven Satan Satan will be hoping to be forgiven and he will be looking forward for an intercession even though his fate has been already predecided has been mentioned repeatedly in the Quran that he will be in hell but he would still think that he may be eligible. Why? He would hope because of what he would see of Allah's vast mercy. Also, and Nabi Sallallahu did not wrap it up right there. He said, um, and if the believer knows the kind of punishment which Allah has prepared for the sinners, he would be afraid that he might not be saved. What does it mean? It means to keep balance between hope and fear. And this is the very important quality of the believers. In Surah Al-Stajda in ayah number 16, Allah the Almighty told us about the believers who stay up most of the night in prayer. Yet they're afraid. They're still afraid of Allah and His punishment. He said, يدعون ربهم خوفا وطمعا ومما رزقناهم ينفقون Their sides forsake their beds. Why? Because they're up praying. يدعون ربهم They're calling on the Lord خوفا وطمعا Out of fear and hope. Beautiful balance. And they give in a charity out of what we provided them with. What is the following ayah? فَلَا تَعْلَمُ نَفْسٌ مَّا أُخْفِيَ لَهُمْ مِنْ قُرَّةِ أَعْيُنْ جَزَاءً بِمَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ No soul knows what has been prepared for them and hidden of a great reward. Comfort for their eyes as a reward for what they used to do. So this is a quality which is praiseworthy admired by Allah, and the believers are encouraged to behave likewise. To do what? To keep balance between hope and fear. In one hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لا يمتن أحدكم إلا وهو يحسن الظن بالله None of you should die, but while expecting good from Allah, hoping for mercy and to be forgiven, 
Why? Because this is at the time of death. That's it. You're done working and you're wrapping up your life. Uh, once Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, visited a young man, Shabban, who was about to die. While lying down on his deathbed, he asked him, How do you feel? How do you find your heart? What do you think? He said, Ya Rasulullah, Arju Allah wa akhafu dhunubi. He said, I hope Allah will forgive me. I'm still afraid of my sins. The Prophet said, لا يجتمعان في قلب عبد إلا عفى الله عنه أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم Which means these two qualities whenever they're combined together in the heart of a servant of Allah at this time, at this situation he will be eligible for Allah's mercy. He will be saved and receive salvation. So what we need to do brothers and sisters is to be optimistic, but meanwhile, do whatever is required in order to be eligible for this mercy. In ayah number 48 of Surah An-Nisa, Allah the Almighty says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ أَن يُشْرَكَ بِهِ وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ Allah does not forgive certain partners to him in worship, but Yet, he forgives any sin lesser than shirk. This is out of his vast mercy. May Allah the Almighty have mercy on all of us, forgive us our sins, accept our repentance, and make us steadfast on the straight path until we meet him safely as believers. Amen. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.